So what explains all this? I want to go back to uh, one of my favorite places to start this discussion is in the discovery of protein. Uh, protein was uh, discovered in 1839 to be specific by Dutch chemist Gerhard Mulder. Um, and uh, he named it after, he, 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 what he was doing, he was doing a research project with uh, a dog or, or, uh, at the time, and he found that if the dog didn't have meat, it didn't live. <laughs> Quite surprising, I suppose. Uh, but he wanted, as a chemist, to isolate in the meat what was so special about keeping that dog alive. Uh, so he needed the name. Uh, he named it after the Greek word proteos, which means of prime importance. So that's where the name protein comes. That really is quite significant to the discussion we want to have here, because uh, protein is the almost a premier nutrient that we have in terms of affecting our thoughts on food consumption over the years. It's been the driver to a great extent of the kind of food that we tend to consume. So the question is why? Um, one way to get a peek at that sort of question uh, concerns the uh, way we have operated with the consumption of protein, especially animal protein. Uh, it rate basically strongly relates, as these uh, World Bank data show, uh, to income producing potential. Not surprising for perhaps the most people, but when we get enough money, the first thing we want to do is to get animal food. Is that simple? I've worked a lot in China and countries around the world, and I can tell you in the countries that don't consume much animal protein, probably because of poverty for the most part, they can't wait to get their hands on protein because they associate it with affluence, like we in the United, United States has. And so uh, this chart here was put out by the World Bank. I drew the line myself uh, just to sort of uh, make sure that there's points on both sides of the line, if you will. And you can see it's basically a straight line of most. Um, the, as soon as we get protein and the and, and then it's the one we want to consume. Um, I mean, as soon as we get money, we want to consume protein. So have money, eat high quality protein. So what is protein quality? That has actually uh, consciously as, as well as unconsciously driven the conversation about food uh, and about protein in particular uh, throughout these, this uh, last century, as a matter of fact. High quality, what it means is that more dietary protein is, re, uh, of the protein we consume, more is retained. And we, we call that in science biological value. Uh, and we eventually called it high quality because it concerned uh, the protein in animal foods, not plant foods. And so when we consume animal foods, a higher proportion of the protein, in fact, is uh, retained by the body. And that was thought to be a good deal. But now, on the other hand, if you look at it somewhat differently, uh, we're animals just as, well as, uh, just as well as other animals. And so when we're consuming their protein, uh, we're getting protein that's more or less similar, very similar to ours, and it gets absorbed better, faster, and more is retained. Uh, and that was thought, thought to be a good idea. Uh, it's not really. Um, and so animal protein has higher retention, more quality. Plant protein is lower quality, lower retention. And that research was done in 1924 uh, by a man by H.H. Mitchell, a professor at the University of Illinois. And when I did my doctoral dissertation in the 1950s, I was well aware at that time of the fact that Mitchell had a very big name. And uh, we were working with the concept that animal protein is better than plant protein. Thus, we called it uh, high quality. But over the years, um, there has been an interest in not disturbing uh, this idea of animal protein being the premier nutrient. And so in more recent years, uh, and uh, we did this in our lab as well as some others, uh, we learned that retaining more protein uh, actually does some other things. It increases the growth hormone, which in turn stimulates the development of breast cancer, among other things. Um, it also increases uh, circulation of uh, blood estrogen associated with cancer as well, free radicals, which has uh, a, a mischievous way of doing things, all kinds of diseases, increases cell mutations. In other words, we retain more protein and we have to suffer these problems, all of which lead to cancer. And I must tell you, this is in the last 20, 30 years or so this has been done. Still today, the scientific community does not recognize this. They still want to call it high animal protein is high quality. 
because of the fact that it just stimulates growth, quite frankly. Uh, but at the same time, it does all these things as well. It also uh, increases uh, cholesterol. Back in the early 1900s, uh, when uh, blood cholesterol was first linked to uh, heart disease, there was an interest in understanding you know, what causes cholesterol to go up in our, in our blood. Uh, and it was the early research showed that it was animal protein that caused it to go up. But then there was a bunch of studies that went on for the next 15, 20 years. And eventually, uh, it was uh, concluded uh, with a great deal of certainty that the chief cause of heart disease is consuming animal protein. It's not saturated fat. It's not total fat. Uh, that's a discussion for another time. But in any case, uh, it increases, in, in short here, as you can see, consuming animal protein increases cancer, increases heart disease, and increases diabetes, by the way. Uh, it increases blood sugar, A1C, which is one of the me measurements that we use to detect um, uh, diabetes, if you will. Uh, in any case, this kind of information here that basically suggesting that higher animal protein increases all three diseases and many more, uh, and we have mechanisms for it to explain it, uh, basically has been canceled out. Nobody wants to hear this. When I say nobody, I'm talking about the people who basically are funding much of the research and selling products. They don't want to hear this, but this is what is uh, very well established. So I've come up with a rather simple back to recommendations. I'm quite familiar with the enormous, infinitely complex systems that sort of uh, control uh, what happens to the nutrients we consume. And it can be extraordinarily complicated and confusing, as I've already mentioned. Uh, but in any case, I've, I've narrowed it down to two things, because I think uh, one way to deal with going forward on this uh, is to uh, make it simple if possible. But at the same time, honor the complexity. In other words, it's terribly complex. Complexity, by the way, with all kinds of things, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of different entities can be picked out one at a time and we learn something about it. We tell the public and we can make any story we want, quite frankly. But there is a very simple way of looking at the total sort of umbrella effect. Uh, and that is simply to consume plants, not animals. Uh, to get into that more in a moment. So, uh, and plants, by the way, uh, simultaneously offers all the nutrients we need at this more or less at the same time. Another one, other point too: um, when we tend to consume animal food, plant food goes down because we we consume for calories. We want to get a certain calorie intake, and so as we increase the proportion of calories from animal food, we decrease the proportion of calories from plant food. So when we look at various kinds of data, we have to keep that in mind. We'll, we'll see something related to one or another thing, but we, we have to keep in mind that there's more than one thing going on. There's lots of things going on, especially in human studies. So uh, now let me come back to the uh, uh, results that, we, uh, that I was involved in in the Philippines when uh, we learned, in fact, that uh, these children who consumed the most protein also had the uh, highest, uh, apparently, the highest risk for liver cancer. And so uh, that was also shown in this study here in 1968 by an Indian group uh, with experimental animals. Uh, they showed that uh, animals had 20% of total calories as protein. And by the way, the protein being used in this case was casein of, of cow's milk. 20% uh, being uh, consumed uh, compared to 5%. Uh, then in these animals, they were predis predisposed to getting liver cancer. Uh, what they were able to show is that to 20%, uh, that's a high level of protein, the regular levels I say here, but uh, on the experimentally, that was a higher level. 100% uh, of the animals got the cancer, and once given a lower protein, none did. I mean, it's really a striking difference. That's in turn uh, what led me to uh, come back home, uh, since we were expected to give protein to these kids higher and animal protein at that, and that kind of result came out. This is really what started my career in, in basic research in, in nutrition. And here's a little chart here showing, for example, the uh, relationship between uh, the cancer formation, this is early cancer, over the first 12 weeks, if you will, uh, when an animal starting with the cancer has already been started, has a gene been mutated. So in any case, uh, during that time, we found that animals 20% protein. Um, 
they grew well. Once we uh, lower levels uh, did not so, did not so good do so well. Uh, exactly what the Indian workers have found themselves. Then we did something else that was kind of striking, namely, uh, as uh, I wanted to see whether or not you know, it was hard to believe this, by the way, because of my own background that animal protein was actually causing cancer. So uh, we tried, decided to do this little trick here, and that was to see what might happen in the early stages of cancer development if we change the diet. So starting out with 20% protein, the cancers were growing well, uh, turning it off by lowering the protein, uh, back on again. In other words, we could turn cancer on and off just simply by regulating the protein intake, animal protein intake in this case. Plant proteins did not do this. It was very striking, as you, as you can see here. And very quickly, just in three weeks' time, you can see this kind of change. It was really about cancer reversal. Uh, and this idea of reversing cancer or uh, serious diseases like this really did catch my attention because what we're doing here is reversing cancer by nutritional means, really striking. Uh, so it also suggested something else too, that for those days, uh, uh, that it's not the genes that really determine cancer. You know, they start with genes, they start with that information. But what, when can, as cancer grows and related diseases like this, that's really a function of the kind of nutrition that we're consuming, the kind of foods we're consuming. So it's nutrition rather than genes that primarily control cancer development. That was published in, they say in this paper here with uh, my students. Um, and as I said before, the uh, soy protein, wheat protein, which we tried to plant proteins to see if it had a, a similar kind of effect, it did not. It, this is specific for uh, the protein of cow's milk and later it was specific for related conditions just from animal protein in general. So then at that point in time, you get something striking like this, it's not believable. Nobody wanted to believe this. I, I was in that group in a sense. Uh, the one, one of the things that you have to do in, in something that's really controversial, potentially controversial like this, determine the mechanism of the effect. Uh, and so, uh, and, and we call that in, in uh, epidemiology, uh, biological plausibility. In other words, we're asking the question with something like this, so striking, uh, is, it, is it plausible? And so we look for the mechanism of the effect. And one of the reasons we do that too, to look for the mechanism, is to uh, see what kind of uh, uh, drug we might use, if you will. If we can identify the mechanism, we can maybe find a drug and block that, that uh, event uh, and then continue continuing on what we want to eat. Uh, so that's what uh, was another purpose for a lot of folks in this business. So here I'm showing you just uh, two representations of the scheme of cancer formation that we tend to work with in, in the research. In other words, cancer, just for this, arbitrarily, we divide it into three stages. The initiation stage, when cancer is forming, and then the promotion stage, when it's being progressed along and over years, in some cases, in the case of humans. Uh, and then the final stage, where cancer is migrated elsewhere, we have metastasis, if you will. And so we, we have this very simple sort of scheme to study things. And uh, so we started out to find this mechanism by looking first at the first stage to see what effect protein had on a bunch of different so-called mechanisms. Uh, and, and it turned out, though the ones here, why I won't go into the details of what's here, but basically the high protein diet increased the rate of the carcinogen into cells it increased their metabolism in such a way, and that's interesting in two ways, increased their metabolism in such a way they formed a product that then bound to the genes, the DNA specifically, and eventually that would translate into more cancer cells. And so we found a bunch of mechanisms here in the first stage, and one of them, it actually decreased the one that was good. In other words, when we get the damage of the DNA occurring uh, that can lead to, help to lead to cancer, the animal protein actually decreased it. So it increased all those things that increase cancer and decreased the one that, that we that is meant to protect against cancer. So then we turned our attention to the second stage, if you can see here, uh, that uh, had some more. And eventually I got to a point where uh, after some years, about 12 to 15 years, uh, and that was all driven for the most part by having students who wanted to do a doctoral dissertation doing research. And uh, so I was doing it almost nonchalantly, just one thing at a time, looking for that mechanism, if you will. After a while, all of a sudden realized 
uh, that after 10 mechanisms of study, which was a great deal of uh, thoroughness, so three or four years, if you will, uh, what I learned was that eight of those 10 mechanisms uh, increased in activity with a high protein diet, uh, two decreased in activity, but lo and behold, that combination of eight increasing, two decreasing, uh, basically all 10 work in unison to increase cancer. That gave rise to another thought, and that was basically the whole idea that nutrients tend to work together in cells. In this case, uh, and they also, as a nutrient comes in, it works by multiple mechanisms at the same time. <laughs>